Thanks everyone for coming out, especially on such a rainy evening. As Frank Hallinan said, uh, one of the reasons for the night is for us to be transparent about our operations, and we always want to be able to explain to you how we do what we do. Uh, but another part of this evening is really about why we are here. Um, and we heard a little bit about mission before, and I want to shift focus now to vision. And one of the things I'm delighted to do tonight is to introduce Dr. John Chubb, who is the president of the National Association of Independent Schools, uh, and an expert not only in the field of independent school education, but is someone who comes to us with literally decades of experience in for-profit and non-profit, public, private, charter, independent school education. Uh, so he will be able to speak to us with great authority about the current state and the future state of learning. Um, his biography is way too long for me to read. You'd much rather hear from him. So I'm just going to say really three quick things about John. The first is that he's been the president of NAIS for almost two years now, and Malvern is very proud to be a member of NAIS. We are not only an independent, uh, not only an Augustinian Catholic school, but we are also an independent school, and that matters very much to us. And I hope that it matters very much to you because I think that is part of the return on investment that uh, both John and I will be speaking about in, in a few minutes. Um, the second is that John is, I think, I, I feel comfortable saying first and foremost as an educator. Uh, he has taught for many, many years at schools like Princeton and Stanford and Johns Hopkins. Um, I think he's been a fellow at Harvard University. Um, so he thinks as an educator as well as uh, a CEO and businessman. And finally, I just want to share something personal about John. He was here just about a year ago visiting campus uh, before addressing the members of Club 14, which are the, the heads of the independent schools in southeast Pennsylvania. And uh, we were very privileged to have John on campus for, for just about an hour. And uh, he walked through the learning commons with me, which used to be our library, and, and he, he commented that the best schools that he has seen in his time as president of NAIS are really doing two things, and the, the learning commons captures at least one of those two things. He said that these schools are leading because of the articulation and commitment to a bold vision. And I think the Learning Commons is a space that exemplifies that. And the other thing he said is that the best schools are really collecting, analyzing, and making decisions based upon data. And we also are entirely committed as an institution to, to collecting and analyzing and making decisions based on data. So tonight we're very privileged to have Dr. Chubb speak with us and to explain not only the future of education but why you guys have made a great investment in your sons. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Chubb. Thank you, Christian, and thanks to all of you for turning out uh, turning out on this dreary evening, although it's a nice relief from the winter, which has been horrible. Um, it's, it's also a pleasure for me to be here in Malvern uh, because uh, this is close to where, where I call home. Uh, I grew up in Drexel Hill. Uh, moved all over the country, worked all over the country, but eventually settled back in the Delaware Valley and I live in South Jersey. So this is an easy evening for me compared to uh, a lot of the travel that I have to do. And, uh, and it, you know, it, it's home, so I'm happy to be here. Um, a few months ago, uh, I, I, I get asked to speak to lots of different audiences. And a few, a few months ago, um, I got asked to speak to a group of parents at, a, uh, at an independent school in Manhattan uh, and the topic uh, was was similar, return on investment, which is so you know you're sort of you're there to tell the parents that they've made a good decision to have their children at the school, and so I you know it sort of went through all the reasons and made this you know sort of passionate uh, offered this passionate explanation for um, for why an independent school education was so good. And uh, the parents seemed to appreciate that. And then I said, so let's, you know, let's open it up to questions. And a hand in the front row goes up immediately from a uh, kind of an older, older gentleman. And he said, uh, he said, Dr. Chubb, he said, that's all well and good. But um, he said, tell me this. He said, uh, how do you explain the following? He said, I had an independent school education from K through 12. And then I went off to college. And I got there. And academically, the public school kids kicked my butt. And I said, uh, what? You know, I, you know so um, as you'll see when I finish, 
an independent school education is a great investment, and this one in particular is. Um, but I'm going to offer something more challenging than the usual list of assets of an independent school education. Um, two weeks ago, the National Association of Independent Schools held its annual meeting up in Boston. Uh, it's not always in Boston. Uh, why we chose Boston in the middle of this kind of, you know, weather, but it held off and we met. And 5,500 people from independent schools all over the country were there uh, to, uh, to, to meet, to listen, to learn. And the, uh, the theme of the conference was design the revolution. Design the revolution. And the basic idea of it is that there's a lot of change coming to, uh, to education. Uh, some of it that might seem pretty threatening, in fact. Um, and uh, it's important for independent schools to get ahead of that. And without hubris, we wanted to say that it's possible for independent schools that have vision and have determination uh, and follow through can actually get ahead of this curve and, and design the revolution. And that actually is the message that I want to share here. Uh, and I want to share with a few stories. Uh, and some of, them come from the, some of them come from the conference, some of them come from my travels. I hope they resonate. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the uh, panels or presentations that we had there for the whole 5,500 people was on Friday morning. And on Fridays, we have teachers there as well as heads and trustees and all kinds of folks. So 5,500 people strong in the audience, and uh, we had on stage for me to moderate a panel uh, for uh, current and former university and college presidents uh, representing uh, Duke University, Wellesley uh, College, um, Swarthmore, Colgate, the University of Denver, uh, York College of Pennsylvania, small liberal arts college, and the University of Southern New Hampshire. You might think, well, that's an interesting group. I don't really know much about the University of Southern New Hampshire, but the rest of them I do. Well, the president of the University of Southern New Hampshire is a gentleman by the name of Paul LeBlanc. And Paul, uh, any of you happen to have been there, you, you will agree with me, I think, but Paul stole the show. Stol Paul has been referred to uh, in the media of higher education as the, and his institution uh, as the Amazon uh, of higher education. And the University of Southern New Hampshire, uh, which was uh, just another very good uh, public institution uh, years ago, over the last decade has quadrupled in size. This is at a time when many colleges and universities are struggling financially, struggling with enrollment. They have quadrupled in size. And they are by far and away the most rapidly growing institution of higher education in the country. Uh, how are they doing it? Well, a number of strategies, but partly they are doing it by changing the way that colleges and universities work. College for most of us, is something that happens after high school and lasts four years in a residential setting. But for people who are beyond a bachelor's degree or for many people coming out of high school who don't really have the luxury or the funds to have a full-time residential education, this model hasn't actually worked. And in fact, even in residential education, you'd be you're surprised to, to know this, but the, the completion rate in four-year baccalaureate residential programs in this country today, and this hasn't changed for 20 years, is 50%. 50%. Right? Uh, the chances of finishing you know, are, like a, a, a coin, are like a coin flip. The college experience is not really perfectly suited to everybody. And Paul LeBlanc has taken advantage of this insight and reached out to families and reached out to students to try to provide something different. Sometimes it's an education that's fully online. Sometimes it's a mixture of experiences that are place-based and online. Now, some people say, well, online education, you know, I've, I've done some of that. It's not really very good. It's like, you know, lecture notes online or like textbook chapters online. That's not real teaching. 
But as he explained to the audience, the state of the art in online education is rapidly, rapidly improving. And as in his experience in higher education, he said that 10 years ago, college presidents worried about how an online course would ever be as good as a face-to-face -face course. And he said today, the worry in higher education is how face-to-face -face instruction will be as good as the best online experiences. And as he also pointed out, this is only going to continue in this direction. Place-based education has been with us for millennia. It, it's, not on a, it's not on a learning curve. Online education has just begun, and it's only going to improve. And so his point was that higher education is being disrupted. It's being disrupted by the availability of technology, by the opportunity to do things differently. He even began to discuss the possibility that degrees like master's degrees won't even exist in the future, the near future. They'll re be replaced by things that are now called badges or certifications. And it's even possible that the baccalaureate will be unbundled. And so the thing that we have thought of as parents and as educators for years and years, getting kids to college, getting them a bachelor's degree, that that may begin to fall apart. I would recommend to you a book that just coincidentally came out this week, and it's by Kevin Carey. And Kevin is a writer for the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, which is like the uh, major uh, outlet for thinking and writing about it. It's the authoritative, sort of the Wall Street Journal for higher education. And Kevin's been writing for them for a long time, but he's also been employed in think tanks in Washington. He's, he he knows, what he's, knows what he's talking about, knows what he's writing about. Um, his book is entitled The End of College. The End of College. And what he forecasts is the eventual demise of place-based education as the main form of higher education. And the argument is that whether you're talking about an 18 or a 22 year old or somebody at the master's level or the doctoral level, that the traditional degrees that say that somehow four years, 120 credits, is the magic number. That is, if you have that, you're something. And if you don't have that, well, you're something else, right? That there's no magic in that. That the way that we bundle knowledge, the way that we credential, doesn't match up with the needs of business and industry in the 21st century. You know, it's, it's sort of legendary now that Google, which is a pretty important industry, business, doesn't ask if you went to college. And if you did go to college, they don't really care where you went. Again, something else that those of us who've spent our lives in education, and I spent mine, half of it, in elite higher education, these were things we counted on as being critical over and over. But Kerry argues, no, that's changing. It's being severely disrupted. And don't be surprised that 20 years from now, college won't look anything like it does today. The workplace. You know, I'm not going to bore you with, this, this, with statistics on how rapidly the workplace is changing. It just is. The jobs that exist today may not exist, likely won't exist. When our kids who are in kindergarten or working their way through school finally finish college or in, and are in the workplace, the jobs that students today are going to hold in the future are jobs that we're not sure what they're going to be. And it's also very likely that students, when they finish their formal education, are going to have to be entrepreneurial enough to create their own jobs to create their own jobs. So if higher education is changing and the workplace is changing, and we hear all this all the time, what does this mean for a K-12 school? I mean, how should we be thinking about this? You know, as we, as we set our vision and we make our plans, should school continue to look 
exactly the way it has, you know, for decades and decades, or even longer? And I think the answer is that we probably need to change. We probably need to change. The question, of course, is how? A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be in the audience at a, uh, uh, at a conference for advancement and development people, a national conference. And I had a chance to hear uh, Walter Isaacson speak. And Walter Isaacson uh, is a, uh, He's a phenomenal journalist, and among other things, he's been the editor of Time magazine and the CEO or chairman of CNN, and now he's the head of the Aspen Institute. Uh, and in his, his spare time, he writes award-winning bi biographies. He's just, like, he's remarkable. Um, if, you, if, if you know his name, you probably know him from his biography of Stephen Jobs that was published about three years ago. It's the only authorized biography of Stephen Jobs. But in addition to that, uh, and it's kind of a funny story, he had written a biography of Albert Einstein, and he'd written a biography of Ben Franklin. And Stephen Jobs called him in the mid-2000s, and they were friends through the Aspen Institute. And Stephen Jobs said, I'd like to talk to you about something. Um, he said, I'd like, he said, I'd like you to write my biography. And Walter Isaacson said, um, I just did Einstein and I did Ben Franklin and you're, you know, I mean, you've got a pretty good company in Apple, but I'm not sure it's really time yet. Uh, sadly, Jobs was ill and Isaacson took up the task and wrote this wonderful, wonderful biography. Uh, since the publication of Stephen Jobs, he's brought out a new book, which I don't think has been out more than maybe six months, called The Innovators. And The Innovators is the story uh, of, the of the inventors who brought us probably the two most important inventions of our time, uh, the computer and the internet. So in his remarks, he made some points that, uh, that were, I thought, quite poignant uh, and in a way that I hadn't quite appreciated. Um, the first thing that he observed was that if you look at many of the most creative geniuses, ones that he uh, chronicled in his various books, um, very few of them got to where they ultimately uh, were, achieved what they achieved, through a linear path from school. In fact, many of them dropped out of school, or left school for a while and came back, um, but they weren't star students. They were people who some teachers would regard as difficult, because they kept asking why, 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 you know, why do I have to do this, you know? Um, that they weren't obvious products, direct products of school, which then raises some question about, you know, whether schools are preparing the next generation of Steve Jobs and others. The other thing that he observed, and this was absolutely the case with the computer and the internet, was that Neither of these unbelievable inventions were the product of any single mind. There's not an inventor of the internet, even though some of our political leaders have claimed that mantle. It's actually not true. Uh, the internet was the product of inventive minds and inventive organizations and think tanks working together over the period of about 30 years that came together ultimately in the internet. And the computer, the computer's genesis goes back to 1810, 1820, something like that, with the first efforts to create something which was called a general, uh, a general computing machine. 
uh, and then over time, various individuals and organizations were involved in it. In a, a great movie that was out a couple of months ago, The Imitation Game, about the code breakers during uh, during World War II. Uh, Turin, the great mathematician from from England, uh, he played a critical role in the creation of the modern computer. But um, Isaacson's point was that when you look at creativity and invention, that on the one hand, you see these people, these geniuses, so to speak, playing critical roles who aren't, often are not products of school. And then you see that the efforts to create new products, to invent the future, are more often than not products of collaboration products of collaboration. Isaacson mentioned, uh, we were down in New Orleans for this conference, and Isaacson, Walter Isaacson grew up in New Orleans. And he went to an esteemed uh, Catholic independent school down there, the Newman School. And he said, when I was in school, and this would have been 45 years ago, he said, he said our school had a word for collaboration. Cheating. So, he was joking, of course. But I think the fact of the matter is that our schools have placed a lot of emphasis, and by our schools, I'm talking about America's schools, I'm talking about schools around the world, I'm talking about public schools, and I'm talking about private schools. Schools historically have placed a great deal of emphasis on the mastery of bodies of knowledge and the mastery of skills. And those bodies of knowledge have been nicely organized in secondary schools into packages that last 180 days, in which participation is required 45 minutes a day. And you name you name whatever it is that humankind has accomplished, and it is delivered in high school in 180-day packages, as, as if this is the way it needs to be done. And then we organize students into age-graded schools, and we move them in batches through the schools, and we evaluate them on their ability to master a body of knowledge and to master skills, and obviously any great teacher expects students to be able to think and to be able to create and to be able to do research. Nevertheless, when students think back about what they were expected to do in school, there is a march through a curriculum. And what higher education is telling us and what business is telling us and other professions are telling us is that for the future, if not for the past, but for the future, where students don't graduate from college or professional school and do one thing forever, and then retire and earn a pension. The word pension will not be in the dictionary soon. That is not the way the world is organized, and maybe education, which was organized the way we know it, many, many generations ago needs to evolve. And that's really where we are today in education, in private education, in public education, in education around the globe, with educators trying to figure out what this should look like, what mix of the tried and true, so to speak, so to speak what mix of our tradition should carry forward, and how does it get modified? How does it get changed to fit the needs of students as they move into higher education and move into the world? I'm going to offer two propositions for which I think there is a reasonable amount of support. One proposition is that education will become and needs to become more personalized so that individual students will have more control 
over what they learn and how they learn. And this will happen partly because it's the right thing to do. If there's one thing that everybody agrees about when it comes to preparing students for the future is that students need to be able to, as adults, stand on their own two feet, to learn throughout their lifetimes, to take control of their learning, to be resourceful. and that this will become more and more a part of how schools are organized. Individualized learning, personalized learning, giving students more agency over their learning, this will happen because it's the right thing to do. It will also be happen because it's more and more possible. And the dominant trend I see in instructional innovation around the country, both in our schools and outside of our schools, is not online learning, by the way, but something that generally now goes under the title of blended learning, which means that instruction is increasingly a combination of student-directed, technology-assisted learning combined with direction, guidance, challenges, from top-notch teachers. That the organization of the school day is not into classrooms. That actual physical structures of schools are changing so that teachers and students have opportunity to learn outside of the traditional classroom walls. I had an experience about a year ago um, I travel a lot, and it's so I get to see with my own eyes what's happening in our schools, what the opportunities are, what the challenges are. And it was, uh, it was actually last January, when it was really cold back here, I had a trip to Honolulu. Well-timed, intentional. So uh, Honolulu, it turns out, has the highest percentage of independent school enrollment of any city in America. I didn't know that. And a very interesting group of independent schools out there, including the president's, uh, President Obama's alma mater, the Punahou School. Um, but this, and I visited that school. It's a wonderful school. Uh, but the school that really struck me was the Kamehameha School. And the Kamehameha School serves about 5,000 students on several islands. It was set up by the final princess of the Kingdom of Hawaii, and it's set up to educate only native Hawaiian children. And it is a tuition-free school because of the legacy, uh, the, the riches that were left by the princess. Um, so in most respects, it's a very traditional school. And when I visited there, I was greeted by a group of uh, middle school girls who were dressed in traditional uh, hula attire. And they greeted me with a traditional hula dance. And it was kind of what I expected, and it was lovely, beautifully practiced. And then after that, the director of the middle school said, would you like to see our new middle school? And of course I did. And from the outside, it looked like any other big school building. It was just a giant rectangle, right? So rather than walking in the front door, which would have been sort of on the length of the building, we walked in the end of the building into what would normally be a corridor. And on either side of the corridor, you'd see classrooms. So we walked in, and all I saw was open space. The length of a football field, and the width of two classrooms and a corridor, nothing but open space. And students were working on both sides of sort of a path that was kept clear for, you know, by the fire marshal as a kind of a corridor. And they were working in small groups, they were working in larger groups, they were working with devices, they were working, working with all sorts of instructional materials. And teachers were there and guiding. But it was very different than what you would see in a traditional classroom, and particularly a traditional middle school classroom. Middle school kids like to be up and about. 
right? I mean, if you've taught middle school, I mean, that's the, are these middle school guys here? You probably get tired of sitting in your chairs, right? And I'm, I'm keeping you in your chairs, and I know you have something lovely to, to display. I'm almost done. So it was just, it was wide open, and it was very individualized. Also, um, also, when you see what's on the computers in schools like this, what you tend to see are something called, something called playlists, which are curricular choices that students get to make. If you're more visual, or if you are, uh, if, if you're more of a, if, if you learn better by reading, or you learn better by manipulation, or you learn better through, uh, through visualization, or what have you, different kinds of lessons may sort you, and technology makes it possible to do that. Technology makes it possible to move at your own pace. Technology makes it possible for you to do calculus in three months, if you want, instead of nine months, or vice versa. It provides tremendous amounts of flexibility. And so schools are opening up these spaces. They're putting curricula on line that's not, uh, not textbook oriented, but is highly flexible to provide for students to be able to master through their own course. At any rate, back to Kamehameha. Saw the first floor of the building look like this, went up to the second floor, exactly the same thing, went up to the third floor, exactly the same thing. I asked the director of the middle school, you know, how did you come to this, you know, conclusion? How did you design this path-breaking building? And she said, you know, we needed new space. We don't know what the future holds. We didn't want the building to hold us back. And so that's what we did. And more and more, schools are creating fewer classrooms and more open space. Your learning space that uh, Christian and others showed me last uh, spring is an example of that. Schools are sometimes converting libraries. Uh, stacks are being digitized, things that seem unthinkable. I was at a, I was at a Benedictine school uh, in California last year, and they had completely eliminated their library. There was not a book left. And they said, you know, it was controversial until we showed them the data. And the previous year, 12 books had been checked out. I'm not here to say what's right or wrong. <laughs> what, I am say, what I am here to say is that we want to prepare our students for the world ahead. And the world ahead is not nearly as regimented as it once was. It does depend heavily on an individual's ability to learn for themselves, to learn throughout their lifetime, and we need to organize schools to do that. And that means changes in instruction, it means changes in what we teach. And there's a lot of positive signs that this is happening, and you have at least one of those signs here, and you may well have others. The second thing that I want to say, and I'll say it very succinctly, is that, is that it, it doesn't matter whether it's the 21st century, or the 20th century, or the 19th century, or any other century, whether having strong, a strong moral foundation is going to be important. And the importance of character and ethics and moral values often gets lost in discussions of education. And sadly, that is happening in public education, where I've spent a lot of time. You know, you can't, you can't really engage in any discussion of public education without talking about the common core. And the common core, you know, all well and good for defining reading and math standards, but that's it. But it's the whole debate. And it's also missing much of the point. You know, for students to learn, students have to be motivated. And students are not motivated by telling them, you know, when they're eight years old, that if you don't work hard, you're not going to get into a good college and earn a lot of money. Right? Students are motivated intrinsically, and we're all motivated throughout life intrinsically. We're motivated because the people that care about us care about what we do, and we want to do what's right in their eyes. As we grow older, we learn things like the road to happiness isn't through selfish pursuits, that it's very hard, impossible to be happy by oneself. We learn that happiness derives from relationships, that it derives from family, 
that it derives from co-workers, that it does in fact derive from collaboration. There's nothing antithetical in collaboration and academics. We learn that having a moral compass is critical, is critical not because that's what your school stood for, not because those were lessons that your school taught you or your parents taught you or your church taught you. These are things that actually turn out to be really critical in life, critical to success and critical ultimately to happiness. So the guidance that we tried to provide in Boston, where we had the annual conference, is that as schools, we owe it to our children and we owe it to our families to be thinking really hard about where college is going and where the workplace is going and to adjust the teaching and learning experience so that our students are prepared. We must do this. We must do this. But at the same time, we should never forget that the key to an education is how we shape a child's life, how we shape a young adult's life. It's their values that are going to hold them, hold them in greatest stead throughout their life. And so somehow as we think about this high-tech future and all the technological disruption, and we need to think about that, we need to keep our feet firmly on the ground and recognize that we're not just trying to educate, but we're trying to change children's lives. And if we do that, we'll be quite successful. That, by the way, is the mission of this school. You know, at the, uh, uh, at the conference at which um, Walter Isaacson spoke in New Orleans, the year before, which was my first time attending that conference, there was an award given to an individual who was a longtime leader of Malvern Prep. And I don't remember the gentleman's name. Right. And he was somebody who, as you know, felt so deeply about this school that when the school was disrupted by demographics and financial challenges and everything else a couple generations ago, he stepped in and provided the leadership that was necessary to keep this school moving forward. And that kind of dedication is what makes a school. The educational program, yes, is critical, and I assure you that schools that don't keep up won't be schools that will stay in business in the future, but we all know that. What we have to have firmly in our hearts and firmly in our belief system is that our vision has to be grounded on these values that are every bit as vital tomorrow as they are today. So thank you for listening.